Improvisational feels to be real. From a planet where males grow up to kill. John reads from his paper, but your boy keeps it real. Hit him with it, you're a dumb, weak, stupid idiot. Throw a little white guild in for the fun of it. Cause Zorp Zorp feels is a line and I'm crossing Unlike it. Unlike ants in my eyes, John Sin, you are feeling it. Uncle Zorp Zorp is not rude if it's honest, yo, and honestly, John's a milk toast piece of garbage, and you better put my enchiladas with the garnish. Just believe, better leave all the cheese that was promised. Each and every weekday, stream to your monitors. We're rating so high that it stops the thermometer. Driving my sports car, Welcome to Blackbird. So today, our uh, discussion is going to be on the book that we read. But first, we're going to do some housekeeping notes. Micah? Yeah. So, uh, for housekeeping, if you guys have any suggestions or comments or questions, or you want to suggest a topic, there's a Facebook page, and there's a link both on YouTube and on Twitch under the About section. Um, if you go to the Facebook page, you can interact with Megan, who is moderating that. Um, is there anything that you have on Facebook? Um, we are still doing Twitch and YouTube, so we both we have channels on both. Uh, and there are some articles on, on both sites that are like further reading education kind of things. Yeah, that's all I have. Awesome sauce. Oh, and that. So if you like Facebook, but if you want to comment on Twitch, you have to have an account, right? Yes. Or did you say that? Did I miss it? I'm sorry. On either <laughs> one, uh, we're watching the chat, so uh, you do need an account on actually both YouTube and on Twitch um, in order to chat with us um, and interact. And there's also a lag. It's like a 15, 20 second lag between you sending the comment and us seeing it. But I will see it, and we will respond. So if this is the first time you're tuning into Blackbird, this is an idea born of recent events, and my thought of maybe more people could empathize or sympathize with what's happening in America right now if we knew our history better. So we decided that we were going to do this, and new media as a way to look at the history. So we're, you know, we look at history, we read books, we talk about current events. If you uh, didn't get a chance to check out our last one, the video is kind of wonky, but it's really good conversation that we had last week. Or last week. Um, so that's where this idea came from. Um, so I'm Megan. And Elizabeth is here, and Micah. Um, so yeah, so today we read our first book, <laughs> um, <laughs> The Power by oh my God. Kelly and Brown. Ellen Brown. <laughs> we all might be a little tired, guess. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Brown, Brown, what is the name <laughs> Um, so. Just a brief overview. Elaine Brown was a member of the Black Panther Party in Oakland. And when Huey Newman left America to, um, on the run, as it were, uh, she took over the party for the time that he was gone. So this is her biography about her life before the party and kind of why she joined the party and then what happened while she was running it. Yeah. I think that's... It's not enough. like... It's a really simple, like, she ran the Black Panther Party, but her life was bananas, like, before <laughs> and during. Uh, so that sounds like a really succinct, like, she was in the Black Panther Party, but it, there's so much more to it. Yeah. Um, hopefully, maybe, by the end of our discussion, if you haven't read it, you'll think to yourself, oh, that was really interesting. I would like to read that book. And you should. This is a really good book. There is, I um, think for me personally, uh, there are a lot of things that I could identify with um, as a light-skinned black woman in America. And unfortunately, like, it's a, it's, it's good and it's bad. Like, it's nice 
to like read a book and be able to identify with somebody, especially a biography, because, you know, that's someone else's life entirely. Um, so in that way, it's really nice that I can connect with her as a, you know, through her book. In another way, it's really, really sad <laughs> that the same things are sort of going on, that a girl who was born in 85 has a lot of um, the identity issues that a woman from the 60s did. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's jump in and talk about the book. <laughs> so we wanted to start, uh, like we want this conversation to mostly be about Elaine. Um, and we'll talk about the Black Panther Party itself next week. Um, but we can't talk about the book at all without going over a little bit of like what the B Black Panther Party was trying to do um, and what they sort of ended up doing. Um, so uh, in the book, they talk about, so one of the quotes I had was, the goal of the revolution was to overthrow the racist US government and to institute socialism in the United States of America. Um, there were young black men who were calling for an end, not only to discrimination, an end not only to denial of civil rights, but to all forms of oppression of blacks, social, political, and economic on all fronts. Um, so that's sort of the party in a nutshell and sort of what they were going for. Uh, I think the other thing that they bring up that I think is really interesting is the survival programs. Uh, which is not something I knew about until Megan mentioned the breakfast, um, the free breakfast that they were doing, I think a couple of months ago. Um, but they did do things like free breakfast meals, health clinics, um, screening for sickle cell anemia. Um, they would bus families to prisons who couldn't otherwise visit their families um, and all sorts of like social programs um, that were really cool. Yeah, I think it's like one of the especially cool and in a positive way long lasting things um, is the school that they started. Mm. Um, and I thought that was really interesting that um, like they got accommodations for being like one of the top elementary schools in Southern California at the time. And you don't hear a lot about those things when it comes to the Black Panther Party. <laughs> Most of the things you're like, they're scary and they were terrorists. And so it was really interesting to um, to read and, and learn about the party and what it did actually <laughs> instead of what it's remembered for. Mm -hmm. And we'll probably get into this next week, but a lot of I think a lot of the narrative of the party is that they're terrorists. Um, and there is definitely a reason why. Um, which has to do with Hoover, and we will totally get into later. Uh, but it's great to read about um, the, the other programs they were going for, and sort of like their. So the the leader of Huey uh, talked about they wanted to start these social programs. So people in the community looked around and were like, "Why does the Black Panther Party that doesn't have a lot of resources can do so much? Why can't my government do do that and bigger because they have more resources?" So it was like a different tactic for a revolution to get the people to be like, hey, I need health care. I need education and like start making demands, which I thought was it's really clever. It's super clever. I totally agree. Um, so I think that was a really interesting aspect just from like a history point of view, like learning about the Panthers and what their goals were. And um where is that quote that I had? Elizabeth, I guess, um, what did you think about, I guess, that sort of part of the book? <laughs> um, I've kind of just been listening to y'all talk. <laughs> so, cause, yeah, because what are the... Uh-oh. Oh, no. You may have lost it for a moment. Might have lost technical difficulties. <laughs> Bound to happen. Okay. Should come back. And, okay, good. <laughs> My internet went out. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but like an experience from within could see could um, seem like it's like well your personal experience is uh, sweeter than like what like like 
if it's actually a terrorist organization, like it doesn't feel that way from inside. But I don't think that's the case at all. Like I think um, it's just <sighs> clearly it means a lot, like to to people from a personal um, vantage, and especially her, like knowing like her life story and how she specifically relates to the party. Um, I think that helps. Like it, it kind of for me is like a window into the whole movement. Um, and also, and also, yeah, it's like we said, it's like it's really good. It's really well written, and she's brilliant, like on multiple fronts. So, so it's almost, yeah, it's like it's almost like she really like it was necessary for her to be part of it. Um, even if it didn't really, it didn't really come to, I think, what they expected or hoped for it. Yeah. Um, but even so, yeah, I don't think that they would have done nearly as much without her, without, like, any intelligent woman in a position of power. I think that really helped. I think that's a good point. Like, we can jump sort of yeah. forward a minute. Um, so when she took over... Um, she made a lot of changes and like a lot of like some of the social programs are there, but the like the school was like her thing um, and putting more women in more offices of power were her thing. Um, she got the I don't remember his name, but the mayor elected to Oakland. like uh, what she accomplished in like five years, six years is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, she did a lot. And I think we're going to talk like if you're talking about, you know, the females in the party, I think, um, like, towards the end of the book, she talks about, she's talking to Huey, and she's saying, like, it, you know, so the members of the party have beaten up a wom the woman who ran the school. The brothers have beaten up a sister who ran the school because she mouthed off. Um, and She's talking to Huey and she kind of is like it like you're sending a message to all of the women in the organization and they're scared and they're frightened and we've made it. We've done all of these things for the party and now you're scaring them away. <laughs> and you, you need to think about what you're doing when you do that. Unfortunately at this point Huey's kind of like whoop. <laughs> um but I think is really like an like an important thing to mention as I feel like as women, a lot of times we are hesitant to bring up our accomplishments, right? We don't want to like, if I toot my own horn, then I'm, you know, then I'm this woman or I'm that woman. So I thought it was really strong and important that she was like, think about what you're doing. Like you're destroying your party by scaring off all of the women in it. I think that's an interesting jumping point um, for the feminism in this book and how women in the party were treated. And I think all three of us were sort of dismayed and shocked how women were. Sh <laughs> to be fair, this is like us in 2020 looking back into the 1960s. And so we all have a tinted view of it. Um, but I think that part is really fascinating. Yeah, I think I feel like that too. And like I look back, I think like, there's like this romanticized history that I have when it comes to feminism, like women burning bras and like, rah! and so reading this to be confronted with like, no, nah, like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't how it was. Um, it was a much more real fight than I guess like my, my brain had romanticized it as. Like, does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, we also have sort of a skewed. So what I didn't realize is that at the time, black women didn't really get into feminism. Like feminism was um, pretty extreme for one, um, but two was considered a white woman thing. Um, and for El Elaine and for the women in the party, it was the first priority was racism. Uh, and so like that is such a big problem that sexism didn't really have a chance. Um, but she definitely was a feminist, even if she didn't realize it. Mm. Um, and also, I mean, I don't know what fe feminism really was was like at the time, but I think if she had a little bit more 
she would have gone after some of those guys a little bit harder and maybe helped her out a little bit. That's also, you know, where we are sitting on our couches in 2020, like, hard to say. <laughs> And I'm like looking for that quote. Mm. Maybe I didn't quote. So there was one part, and I think it, like for me, it was very telling. Um, so they're at like, I guess, an after party after the meeting. They're all kind of playing around in someone's house, and one of the women comes around and is like, hey, like, we're going to buy food. Do you have any money? And, you know, they, they put in, you know, their money that they have, which also, like, we're thinking about the time. So think about the time period. Like, they don't have as much money, even as the, like, even the disparity, like, the black men don't have much money. Like, the black women have even less. Mm-hmm. Um, but they kick in to, you know, because it's a party and everybody kicks in, right? And then when the food gets there, they get up to go stand in line and are told that that's not their place, that they need to sit and wait for the men to be fed first. And I think that's why I sort of like, well, you're a feminist. Because she's like, well, nobody said anything about them being fed first when y'all were asking me for money. And I was like, that's such a thing I would say. <laughs> that, sounds like, that sounds so me. Um, and... So I think that was really interesting and like even as progressive as the party was that they had these like arcane thoughts like ingrained in them like your men are your warriors and you have to take care of them first um and then also the men ate all the food and they didn't get anything to eat <laughs> <laughs> like, I would have been <laughs> she like leaves isn't she she's like I'm out I'm done <laughs> yeah I thought I had highlighted it, but I didn't. But bas- that's basically the story. <laughs> I have um, the quote from the guy who comes and talks to them. Mm-hmm. So it's sisters, he explained, do not challenge brothers. Sisters, he said, stood behind their black men, supported their men, and respected them. In essence, he advises that it would not, not was not only unsisterly of us to want to eat with our brothers, it was sacrilege from which blood could be shed, which is pretty extreme for trying to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um. The one I liked is um, where it sort of clicked with her about mm-hmm. how she's actually sort of a feminist. Um, so I think that's one of the things I have marked too. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's towards the end. So um, she was accused of being a, a man hating les- lesbian. Um. She had joined. So quoting, she said she joined the majority of black women in America denouncing feminism. It was an idea reserved for white women, I said, assailing the women's movement wholesale as either racist or inconsequential to black people. Sexism, sexism was a secondary problem. Oh, my God. Sexism was a secondary problem. Capitalism, racism are primary. Now hearing the ugly intent of my opponent's words, I trembled with a fury long buried. I recognized the true meaning of his words. He was not talking about making love with a woman. He was attacking me for valuing women. The feminists were right. The value of my life had been obliterated as much by being female as by being black and poor. Racism and sexism were equal partners in my oppression. Um, and this is this is after she like she's in charge of the party and she put different women in like different positions um, and she was attacked for doing that and realizes she's attacked because she finds women valuable and good at their jobs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So very interesting. I love a lot of the things that she does. Um, to like, and I feel like it's um, like early on in the book. Um, what is this? Um, like I sort of read this quote as it being both ways, right? Um, so she's in high school and they're handing out awards at the end of the year. Um, so the quote is, the Latin prize was finally announced, which only one of eight of us could possibly receive, which only Francine should have received, 
Francine was passed over again. It was an outrageous display of racial prejudice, a concept, a reality that was so profound it was not missed, even by me, who wanted to be white. And I think, um, I feel like that's, like, she says it's a race thing, but I think it's, it's like, almost, it sort of also intersects with, like, her willingness to stand up for another woman, right? So, like, I, at the time in her head, you know, and, it, I mean, it totally was racist. They went to an all girls school. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for me, it's sort of, like, like, I think it, in that instance, it's kind, it's sort of both, right? Like, not only is this racist and, hey, that's wrong, but, like, you know, um, standing up for, for another woman. And I think that's um, something really profound and interesting. And I think a lot of that is sort of missed when it comes to, like, um, like black women. It's like we don't think of it as, like, standing up for another woman. You think of it as standing up for, like, a, another black woman. But it's it's both, right? We can, I can stand up for you because you're a woman and because it's, like, that duality, I guess. Is that the word? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just thought that part was really interesting. I thought a lot of – I was – as much as, like, the book is about the Black Panther Party, I really enjoyed, like, the early part of the book when she's talking about growing up and, like, the life that she that she led um, before she entered the party. And that was, like, like, the party stuff was really interesting and very, like, I want to go look at this more. <laughs> but I'm not, like, that's how I read books. Like, I... It's easier for me to get into a book if I can identify with the protagonist, right? <laughs> um, so even though this is nonfiction, <laughs> um, it helped me a lot to identify with her while I was reading. So do we want to jump towards that or I guess jump backwards and talk about like her life before the party? <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of thinking about, like, um, so growing up, it didn't seem like she was comfortable being being black, and she wasn't totally sure, like, who she was meant to be, and a lot of it had to do with her relationship with her mom. Uh, so when Elaine was growing up, her mom um, pushed her into, like, special schools, private schools. She took ballet classes, she took piano classes. Um, and for, I, I want to say most of her childhood, she was more comfortable when she wasn't at home. Like going home was really scary for her. And I think um, that too is like, like her describing those apartments just sort of makes you like, oh. <laughs> I mean, she talks about hearing, though, so Mike and I lived together for a while, and there was one night where we heard like skittering and like, that is, if you've never heard that noise, it makes your flesh crawl. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, to hear that noise every single night, yeah. I can't, like, that's gotta, like, it just has to wear on you in ways you can't possibly imagine. And, that, like, her mother did her best. So, like, her mom would... Like, try to protect her physically, maybe less so emotionally, but definitely physically, like, in the house. Um, so, like, Elaine wasn't alone when she took she took baths, so her mom could knock cockroaches um, not into the tub and other terrifying scenarios. Um, but it, she's also putting a lot of pressure on her daughter emotionally, which I think is an interesting, protecting her physically, but also pushing her to be a different person, maybe. Um, to be better, to be her savior, right? She talks a lot about that, and there's um, a part in the book, of course, I didn't highlight it, where her mom tells her, like, I had a dream before you were born that there was this little girl, and she looked just like you, and she told me, like, I'm here to save you. Mm -hmm. And one, like, that's a really messed up thing to tell. 
to your children. It's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think so. There is a lot of that. I think parents in general want their kids to do better, to be better, right? I think in this instance, it it takes on like an overwhelming pressure, right? Like anything that you do wrong is not just like not just you made like not just you messed up, but like you jeopardize our future because you didn't do the thing you were supposed to. Um, I think that was really interesting. I also found it kind of weird that she doesn't talk about her mom's reaction really when she left college. Oh, she doesn't, does she? She's like, she sort of just glazes over that. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I thought was really interesting because I feel like that would have been a very dramatic scene <laughs> in her life. I wonder if, like, at that point, Elaine was like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do stuff for me now, you know, like, I'm done listening to you. Um, and her mom does follow her. So Elaine drops out of school, goes to LA, and her mom follows her a year later, I think. Maybe mm -hmm. not even, maybe just months. I, uh, was a couple of, I wanna say it was like six months later, because she was there and she was working, and then she lost, not lost her job, lost her job? Quit her job. Quit, Quit her job. Maybe? Maybe she like got to that point where she was like, Mom, I can't do you anymore. You do me. I think it's really interesting. She talks a lot about like this anxiety and the suffering and like not being able to sleep at night. And when she wakes up, and I think that's very interesting about like the mother daughter relationship, right? Like even when you don't like your mom, you still need your mom. <laughs> Um, so she would like to wake up in the night and be like, mom, mom, that feeling. And I sort of just internalized that to be like, anxiety. <laughs> My anxiety is waking me up. Um, and her mom would just hold her until she could go back to sleep. And the juxtaposition of like her mom doing those things and then at the same time putting so much pressure on her that she like, going to California. <laughs> not only am I going to California, I'm not even staying with our relatives. I'll figure it out when I get in. <laughs> so I thought that was really, really interesting. That, like, their whole relationship, I found really interesting. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about, like, who... Or who she was or who she wanted to be. It, I think, like, the first part of the book in our childhood, she talks a lot about hanging out with white kids and wanting to be a white kid mm -hmm. and possibly be a Jewish kid. Um, which I thought was interesting, but I also, you know, I don't know what that feels like. Um, so, like, this is, she's talking about her friend, um, who's a boy, her friend Billy, and they had this sort of unspoken bond and she says but we knew we knew a sense of separation from the mainstream of life and we knew it had to do mostly with our inability to fit into any mold anywhere and I thought that was that hit me pretty hard because I you know I have felt like that in the past um where you just feel like you don't belong and not even just racially but just like in anywhere like you don't take up any space you have no you know and you don't know who you are like there's another quote where she's like I fell into this nothingness because I knew I was nothing like I was this person who didn't even, I didn't even have a favorite color <sighs> and um I think that is I don't think a lot of people feel that way or if they do a lot of people don't give voice to it but like it hit me like that part hit me hard because like I have been there <laughs> where I just you know and it's not like she didn't have friends right she had friends you know she had a place as it were right she had you know school and she had friends at school and um but she still felt this way right she still felt like she didn't belong anywhere it, it, I think that feeling followed her for most of her life because she also she like almost left 
the party like twice, you think? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, and by that point in her life, she was um, late 20s, early 30s, and seemed really weird. But that, I think that feeling like followed her the whole way through. Yeah, there's a part that I marked um, about like after Steve beat her up, um, where she said, I'd, and I'd seen the core of my fear, which was loneliness. This is the deepest truth of why I was in the Black Panther party of why I smothered my life with Huey Newton. This, it's, life was as lonely as death. Like it essentially gives her a purpose. So like, even at that point, she kind of feels like she doesn't, she doesn't know who she is or what she should be doing. So like, this gives her some kind of like structure and thing to believe in and follow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I think, I think that's one of the things is like what scared her about, life was just living and like trying to figure out who she was separate from like a man or a movement well i think it's interesting too so even like she commits herself to the panthers and so i um, marked this quote and um they're talking about um moving guns (laughs) and uh, moving guns it's helpful to have a woman in the car because they're less likely to be pulled over and she says, a bourgeoisie, a bourgeoisie, yeah, that word is hard. <laughs> bougie. Bougie. <laughs> a bougie looking sister like yourself, Erica said. I resented that label, as did Angela Davis, who had also begun working in the party. It was an unacceptable characterization of my life. It separated me from the other panther. Um, and so even though she's, She's like, she still has no place, right? She's part of the Panthers. She's part of the movement. And, you know, the other people in the Panthers are saying these things about her that are hurtful um, and that separate her. Like, yeah, you're one of us, but not really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think like all of that was just very interesting. And for me, it's very relatable. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. What's next? (laughs) <laughs> that was sort of the like the topics, the headlines that we had. Any other just general things about the book? Things you would like, hey, if you I don't know, if you were gonna tell somebody to read this book, what what would you tell them? Why would you say they needed to read it? Why is it important? Well, it's like, uh, well, why it's important? Uh, so I I talk to y'all just like privately about like I started watching a Black Panthers documentary um, and it's bit, but it's like I got halfway through and I at some point like kind of lost track and it's cool because like I, I feel like I know these people now so it kind of puts some context to it I, can, I, I understand I think when I go back and, and watch it over I will have a better idea of like what is happening and who is doing stuff. Um, but also like, it's just, it's a really well-written book. It reads like just a novel or a memoir. Like it does, you get bogged down in parts of it. And I think, but that was, it's like, we, we kind of talked about the, the first chapter is like, she's already, she's just been named the leader of the party. Um, and it's, it's, kind of I don't know if it's just me like I have a hard time sometimes getting through the first chapter of any book to get into it but also like it becomes more personal after that chapter I think and that like I got really sucked in like right after the first chapter was over um and I just I really enjoy reading and I like her voice a lot what would you do my guess someone was like why should I read this book (laughs) Yeah, like, smartly, like, one of the things I like about this book is the history aspect to it. Like, I feel like I'm the one who's always like, I, I looked up this thing. Like, sorry. Um, so, like, the history part is, like, a real kick in the pants, and I like. Um, but also, it's supposed to read a story about a badass woman in 19, you know, 72. Um, so, it's it's cool what she accomplished. Um, and what she, like, came in contact with us, like, some of that stuff, I would have shit my pants. Like, there were guns everywhere. 
she was around people who were assassinated. Um, and it, it's crazy. And it's really cool to read. It's definitely, and I think it's, um, like sort of like Elizabeth was saying, it's like when you, if you, I'm, sometimes when I can't get into a book, I'll watch the movie first. <laughs> oh, that never works for me. <laughs> and, and it doesn't work for everybody. But sometimes, like, you can do that, right? So, like, I watch the movie, and then I go, and I can, like, really get into the book. And I think this book is a really good way of sort of jump-starting you into wanting to know more about the Black Panther Party and what they did and what their goals were and all of all of the things that they accomplished and how they were attacked by the government. And you like, you read this book and you want to know more. Um, and I think she does a really good job of balancing those. Like there are parts where I'm just like, this is too much of her. <laughs> <laughs> but I think she does a, a relatively good job of balancing like her personal experience and talking about what the party was about. I think it's a good starting point, too, because a lot of people consider that um, she ruined the party. She was like she was the reason for the downfall. So I think it's a good place for us to have started, because otherwise we may not have really gotten into that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that is one other thing. It's like if, if you're looking at it from a historical point of view, I mean, maybe you get all sides, but I think she does do a pretty good job of, like, I understand that, like, the Black Panthers got demonized by um, Hoover. But also, like, there were divisions within the party. There were other, like, other movements that were, like, it's, it, it there were a lot of things that happened. And I was thinking about that. It's like, that's kind of any movement, like there's just as much chance that things are just going to go sideways and <laughs> not work out. In fact, that seems to be mostly what happens to like third parties. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's like, it's not one person's fault and it's, it's, it's all subjective. Like it depends who you are and at what time period and all that and where you were. Um, okay, so I think this is a quote from the last chapter. That he was opening a door through which history might come to define the party for its worst, not its best. John and Bunchy and Fred and George and so many others are food and other programs that provided a concrete means for our people to survive and develop the will to make revolutionary change in America. And I think, I don't, I mean, she wrote this book way after all of this happened. Um, so I know that's part of like her reflecting on it. Um, the very true statement, you know, um, when you start to go down a path, right, mm -hmm. then you do, um, and that's what happened, right? That's what the Black Panther Party is remembered for. They're remembered for the things that they did wrong <laughs> instead of <laughs> what they did right. Um, so I kind of, unless you guys have anything else to say about the book, any questions? I haven't seen any questions pop up from our Hey, in the chat room, questions. <laughs> huh? We get a poke up. Poke up. <laughs> See what it's like. <laughs> okay, so I thought that this would be a good way to end um, our discussion. I was abandoning something, but I was saving something. It was the hope that had been my hope, and my mother's hope, and her mother's hope, and the hope of each of my people. Mothers, aunts, brothers, fathers, children. Mm. And that, so she's talking about she's leaving to save her daughter. And that really hit me. I'm, ugh, I'm all goosebumpy now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the hope of all, all people. I think especially black people in America that you want to change the world so that it's better for your kids. Right? You want to leave? Ooh, okay. 
Oh, all of the fields. So anyway, it's a great book and you should read it. <laughs> um, so next time we're going to just delve into the Black Panthers. So that's what's next. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. We'll talk more about the history of the Panthers, what they did, how they started, um, what the government did to the Black Panthers, mm-hmm. and Maybe kind of talk about why we think of them the way we do. I think that would be so I think that should be a really interesting and good topic for us. Um, so I think that's all we've got for today. Yeah. Get on the Facebook. Make um, up. Questions. Please ask us questions. Or just let us know that you're there and we're not talking. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so be safe. Don't be a racist. And wash your hands. Rolling like I used to. Oh. Flat top, fresh waves with the new shoes. Oh. Started-